uh, since all these tables are put together, I'm going to look this way for a while. We can just throw into those chairs here, too. We could, but then, no, I think If you like to see stand up, but let me try to open up the discussion here by talking about, uh, by framing some of the, the points that uh, come up when I think about labor and the Occupy movement. First of all, uh, just in case, it could be that everybody here is already completely familiar with the experience of, of uh, labor and the Occupy movement, what kind of interventions the labor movement has had over the last couple of months. Uh, on October the 5th, for example, 30,000 people, uh, 30,000 new members, marched from uh, Foley Square to uh, Zuccotti Park in New York City as an expression of solidarity with the Occupy movement. On October 13th and 14th, there was a uh, similar mobilization in New York City to stop the eviction. Uh, it was uh, one of those things that overnight that emails went out to people, come down here to stop the eviction, and, and lots of union members did, and the eviction, the eviction at that moment uh, was stopped. Uh, on October the 19th in Los Angeles, there was another march of uh, thousands of uh, uh, people from the labor movement, the organized labor movement, uh, to, uh, to the Occupy movement and uh, demonstration in Los Angeles. And of course on November the 17th across the country in St. Louis and in distant places like Reading, Pennsylvania and, and uh, Great Falls, Montana, lots of places around the country from Chicago to everywhere else, there was uh, substantial labor participation in the Occupy the Bridges, Occupy the uh, Occupy movement as it was expressed around the country. And, uh, and there have been significant um, participation on, on the part of the Occupy movement in terms of highlighting the Verizon struggle by participating in picket lines at, at Verizon and also in, in various AFT actions. So there is, a, uh, there is a, a strand of participation by the labor movement, although it's frankly much, much less than, than, than its potential. And I don't mean its potential like, you know, we, the organized working class, uh, what we could do, but even its potential in its current state, it could be turning out a lot more people and doing a lot more. The uh, Wisconsin um, uh, events, and how many people here were up in Wisconsin? Nobody. Well, I was up there a lot. Uh, and it was... Uh, and I've been around for a long time, as I said, about 40 years in the labor movement. And, uh, and that was an event that was completely different than, say, uh, when PACCO was decertified by, by Ronald Reagan in 1981. And that happened in August, like August the 5th, I think, of 1981. And within weeks, they organized Solidarity Day 1, and there were like 500,000 people in Washington, D.C. on a relatively warm fall day. And they were marching, and it was, it was big, it was powerful, but frankly, it, it lacked militants, it lacked real uh, spirit of struggle. People were just there walking, frankly, for those of us who were there. I don't know if you were there, Mike, I was there. Uh, and uh, this, in Wisconsin, was completely different. The, both the energy was different, and uh, the occupation was different, because it was staying there for long periods of time. And hundreds of thousands of people, as the brother was saying, hundreds of thousands of people were participating in Wisconsin on a, con not a continuous basis, but, uh, uh, you know, people would leave, people would come, but lots and lots of people were uh, occupying the streets around the Capitol and marching around the streets in the, streets in the major uh, demonstrations. Even after the bill was signed, even after the bill was signed, was the biggest uh, thing. So that was essentially, the occupation of that Capitol was the sort of first occupation this year uh, leading up to the occupation uh, movement that... Uh, erupted in the summer. But the labor movement uh, has had lots of moments in history where it, had, it has engaged in occupation. Occupations that have shaken the, the, the roots, the, the structure of the capitalist system in a very profound way. I just want to mention a couple of them because not to go into any uh, history that might be putting people to sleep. But in 1877, when the railroads were imposing yet another wage cut on, on workers around the country, the, uh, a general strike broke out, broke out frankly, first in, in Baltimore, went up the, the, through the railroad lines to, to Reading, Pennsylvania, went to Chicago, went to St. Louis. And the leaders of that movement, largely in Reading, Pennsylvania, in Chicago, and St. Louis in particular, where the, the, the struggle was at its greatest. And this, these were movements where people were dying. They were fighting the, uh, what was essentially the, the equivalent of the National Guard. They were fighting them, and they were dying in the streets. So who was organizing these general strikes? Because as you know, there were no 
uh, the, the union movement, and, and there was no organization of, of railroad workers at that time, no union of railroad workers, but there were other unions. And so in some places, in, in Cincinnati and Chicago, uh, and, and uh, particularly in uh, St. Louis, who was leading these things? It, it was the, the left, and the left who was also involved in the labor movement at the same time, and they were youth. In Chicago, for example, uh, Albert Parsons was 29, and he was taking a leading role. And, not, and when I say leading role, it's not just, okay, I'm participating on, on a demonstration day, but a leading role in figuring out the strategy and tactics of, of the action. And how are they going to be able, how are they going to uh, move here or move there? How are they going to fight the, the police in this particular situation? So Albert Parsons was age 29, George Schilling was age 27, Thomas Morgan was age, 20, age 30, and if you read the history closely, those names are the names of the leaders of, in the Chicago battles in 1877. Similarly, in, in, in St. Louis, where as, you know, some people have called it a commune, was, uh, existed in 1877, meaning that they had occupied the city, taken over the functions of government, and deciding, okay, well, here's an emergency service that needs to be carried out. These people are going to uh, do this, and they have passes. They can go ahead and, and work. Other people are going to be on strike, and other people are going to be demonstrating here. And here's the battle's plan for dealing with the police and the National Guard. So youth were leading that as well. A guy named Albert Curlin was age 24, and a bunch of other young people. So the Occupy movement, in a, in a big way, uh, in a very demonstrable way, has deep roots, and, and that's one of them. In the 1890s, uh, there were, and this was not exactly an occupation in terms of a general, uh, in terms of uh, seizing certain territory, but there were general strikes in the 1890s. There was a general strike in New Orleans and the ports. Uh, and, and I don't know if you know much about uh, Louisiana and New Orleans, but uh, it's obviously in the part of, of slave territory, <coughs> former slave ter territory not long after that, in a period of racist reaction in the United States where lynchings were rising th through the 1890s. And, uh, and they were able to have the black and white workers together, striking together in a general strike up against the state in the, in the 1890s. In 1894, there was a Pullman strike. 275,000 workers in 27 states were on strike. That wasn't exactly seizing a particular territory, but that sort of characterized the, the, uh, what was happening in, in the 1890s as sort of a, a mass rebellion. They, and another struggle in, in Idaho in 1894, or 1895, about the same time as the Poland strike that I just described, they, they put 500 workers in, in a bullpen and kept them there because they were striking miners who were striking. From 1898 to 1905, the membership uh, and unions uh, multiplied by four times. Why? Because the left was leading a struggle uh, uh, in late labor at that moment to try to get more unions, to try to get rights on the job, to try to get rights in society generally for, for free speech and everything else. You may not know it, but in 1917, everybody probably remembers that in April 1917, the United States government declared war. You know, they went into World War I uh, to try to divide up the rest of the world to try to get their little piece of the pie, as imperialists do. And, uh, and during that time, let's think about it. For those people who are uh, around and, and conscious in 2001, everybody remembers 9-11, and the, the reaction that happened after that. Now, the state employees in Minnesota were on strike in, in, in 2001. And they were vilified for being, oh my God, how can you do this? You're not being patriotic because you're on strike. And it was, a, it was frankly, it was a big uh, struggle, a big battle, uh, to try to gain public support in that situation and, and to win the strike. So here they are, not just a 9-11 situation, but a world war. And, and, and in a wartime, uh, everybody's supposed to fall in line. And, um, and it, it goes like that. I, re I remember that uh, there was a... Uh, I was doing uh, there was a resolution to, uh, in 1990, 1990 uh, 1991, a resolution against the war that the Union uh, asked me that I was uh, with, that I still with, passed a resolution to be against the war. And so on the day that, that the war broke out, I'm in a rally, I'm uh, talking about it, and I'm saying, and after you cancel the uh, you know, we were against the war. The next day, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> because, <laughs> because, well, once the war's on, yes, we're anti war until the war breaks out, and then it's another story. So, so in World War I, it was the, the intensity was much, much worse. People were being deported by the thousands. People were being put in, in uh, jail, uh, for, if you were a German, for example. And, uh, and, yet, and yet, there were general strikes. There was a general strike in Springfield, Illinois, in, in 1917. 
Springfield, Illinois. That's where I live right now. And uh, exactly, it's not, not exactly the heartbed of radicalism, but it was. Um, yeah, but but uh, then it was, yeah. And, and Bloomington, Illinois, was almost a, a general strike when Mother Jones was there on, on streetcar workers in July of 1917. In August of 1917, the streetcar workers in Springfield went on strike. And in September, they were attacked by the, uh, on a Labor Day uh, march, they were attacked by the police. And in response to that, uh, and the miners were in that, that, uh, that demonstration, in response to that, they, they went on uh, a general strike against the police brutality and in support of the streetcar workers for several weeks. And that wasn't the only occasion. There, in Kansas City, there was a general strike a couple of months later for, um, uh, triggered by laundry workers. And there was a general strike in Waco, Texas, and there was another brief general strike in, in uh, Milwaukee. So it was a period where people were challenging the system, not in a broad way, because it, it, uh, if that was the case, we'd probably be in a different situation. Uh, but it was, uh, there were strong, uh, there was a, a sense of rebellion. There was a Green Corn Rebellion, for example, in Missouri and, and uh, throughout uh, some of the Midwest, where native workers and, and union workers and African Americans uh, had an armed rebellion, armed rebellion against the draft. Uh, but that's another story. In, uh, in the 1930s, what, what's the thing that would uh, resonate with the Occupy movements now? It was the occupation of the factories, the occupation of the rubber plants, the occupation of the packing house plants, the occupation of the auto factories that won unions. And not just won unions, but they were part of a broad social movement that was against racism, against political repression, and for advancing labor's cause and the working class cause on a, on, a, uh, on a large scale. And who was leading, I want to emphasize this again, who was leading that struggle at that time? If you look at the leading uh, at the leaders of the uh, CIO, for example, the new CIO unions, even some of the AFL unions, were in their, uh, in their early to mid-30s. The general strikes that occurred in 1934 in San Francisco, for example, uh, who was leading that? Not only the uh, uh, ILGWU president, who was in, like 33 years old at the time, but also Communist Party uh, leader Sam Darcy, who wa was calling the shots with, with him uh, uh, to, on the strategy and tactics. There was, a, there was a woman who was in her 20s who was leading uh, a strike of 18,000 cotton workers in Southern California. Think about uh, organizing, being first of all that age, come one, organizing a strike of 18,000 cotton workers having to maintain picket lines that were over a hundred uh, mile uh, stretch of road. It's a daunting task and yet they, they were doing it. And, and in 1946 there were general strikes in, in uh, Oakland and uh, triggered by retail clerks, you know, that the whole city went on strike to, to defend the right of retail clerks in a small store to be able to have a union. And there was a general strike in Rochester, New York, over the firing of public employees who wanted to join a union. And essentially, they were able to win on that. So there are moments in history, uh, I just picked out a few of those, to highlight the fact that, that labor has a, a tradition, really, of occupying, a tradition of rebelling against the system, uh, uh, up to the point of challenging the system with a, uh, something that is, is, is as dramatic as a, a general strike. It's very clear and was already brought up by the, the speakers, I think in it very well earlier, about the, uh, the, the obvious unity of interest between the, the, those who say we're for the 99% and, and the labor movement. That's almost a no-brainer because the working class is 99% uh, of the 99%. And the labor movement, of course, the organized labor movement, unfortunately, only represents about, uh, the, in the private sector, about 7% of all workers. And, and the labor movement, as was discussed uh, previously, has a lot of limitations. They stayed away, for example, in the, in the general strike that took place by the Latino workers in 2006 that shut down all kinds of cities across the United States. The labor movement, in general, was staying out of that. Uh, so that there are lots of weaknesses there. But, uh, but it's obvious that, that labor has an interest in being involved in any movement that's for, for the 99%. One thing that was mentioned, but I'd like to highlight, uh, 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 you know, uh, somebody talked about the We Are One, One rallies, which were uh, labor rallies from in, uh, in March and April of this year, creating a, a We Are One, supposedly, supposedly a We Are One organization nationally that's sort of uh, dead at this moment, although it's electronically alive. The... Uh, its slogan was what? Save the middle class. 
And that was such a, a divisive slogan. You know, how many, first of all, how many people working who were unemployed consider themselves part of the middle class? How many people who work at Target or, or Kmart or, or Walmart think themselves as part of the middle class? I mean, it's a, frankly a stupid, uh, you could call it stupid in one level because it's certainly stupid. But it's also a reflection of where the labor movement is to try to say, okay, we're going to uh, say save the middle class uh, as, a, as a slogan. So the Occupy movement has influenced the, the labor movement so that that slogan is now either changed, uh, changed or it's de-emphasized or it's mixed in with the 99% cent, 99 slogan. The, uh, the question though that I think it, it bears some discussion is why isn't labor all in? I mean, this, if this is a, uh, a movement for the 99%, and if labor is, uh, is uh, you know, all in that 99%, and we have the most to gain, labor has the most to gain from uh, pushing this struggle as far as it can possibly go, why isn't it leading it? Why isn't it all in when, when uh, an action is called? I know my organization, I, I work for Aspen Council 31, we have 75,000 members, and, and uh, we have 30,000 retirees. We can put uh, many, many thousands of, of members on the street uh, if we want to, and we have, and we, frankly we do it repeatedly. But, but we haven't done it, uh, uh, we haven't done it for, for the Occupy movement. Now why is that? And not just uh, ask me, count, ask me in, in Illinois, I'll be done in just a second, ask me in Illinois, uh, but we're frankly ask me is more progressive than, and Illinois is more progressive than frankly anywhere else around the country. The, uh, but uh, posted this question more generally for labor. And I think if we look at the historic roots, I mean, some of the, uh, one of the brothers was talking about the situation from uh, after the Second World War. After the Second World War, there were, and I'll try to tie it into what's happening now because it seems almost inconceivable, but how could something right after the Second World War have an effect today? But after the Second World War, hundreds of thousands of people, in, workers in every industry were on strike. Millions were on strike from 1945 to 1948, 49. Millions of people were on strike. And not just small strikes, I mean big, militant, strong strikes, where they were out there battling, where they were winning, that's the period of time generally when they were winning pensions and, and other basic rights, as well as the right to a union. The, uh, but the, the ruling class, could, could, did, not, did not want that. They were coming off of uh, yet another imperialist war. And they, they, uh, they wanted to crush this, this movement here. And it was not only here, but around the world. And, and they passed the Taft-Hartley Act. Well, you could say, okay, the Taft-Hartley Act banned secondary boycotts. The Taft-Hartley Act banned communists from being uh, members of unions and being in leadership of unions. Even in 1975, when I became president of a, of a, of a local, even by that time, you were still required to sign something saying that I'm not a communist, I'm not going to overthrow the government, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the, uh, uh, so that tearing the heart of the movement out, and, and really they were putting people in jail, they were having uh, House of Un-American Activity uh, hearings, uh, and you would come in to see your, your town paper in the morning and see all the people who were listed, who were reds in, in your town, who were me union members who needed to get out of town as fast as they could. So there was that, but they were also passing laws uh, on right to work at the same time, and passing laws saying that, that in 1947, in particular in New York, in Ohio, in Michigan, uh, saying that, that, you didn't have, that public employees didn't have the right to strike. Public employees, in some cases, didn't have the right to be in a union. And in Missouri, and in Virginia, and a number of other states, they were passing laws saying that even if you're not a public employee, if you're working in a private company performing a public, public service, then we can, the state can come and take over your, uh, your company and, and, uh, and run it because to break, in order to break the strike. And where did they get that idea from? From Truman, who was taking over the, the mines, from Truman, who was taking over the steel mills in order to break strikes. It's hard to, to imagine it now, but that, that broke the union. Whereas before, particularly from the 30s, the, the union movement was, had a social vision and was more about power after that time, and, and there were some very specific agreements in the auto industry, for example, they were about not power, but about pennies. How much money can I get, How much, and how can we tie that to productivity, and all that kind of stuff that's so much more integrally uh, tied to the system. 
There were still, uh, in this period of time, that's when Operation Dixie was defeated in the South. That was an organizing drive to organize the South. In this time, period of time, they, uh, any time that struggle might break out, there was a big struggle in Indiana called Perfect Circle Strike. They declared martial law. They surrounded the, the, comp the company with tanks. They, they broke the strike there. That was the, the, what was happening in the 1950s. And it wasn't until really the, the late 70s, in the, in the wake of the anti-war movement, that the labor movement started to wake up again. And from 1970 to 1973, there were huge, lots and lots and lots uh, of strikes. It began, of course, with the postal workers. Uh, a couple hundred thousand people striking in order to get the right to strike, striking in order to have the right to a union, and uh, an illegal strike. And they won. And that uh, catapulted lots of stuff against racism in the auto plants, where the illegal revolutionary black workers it catapulted lots of stuff in lots of places around the country. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of radicals who were going into the plants, myself included, uh, going into the factories to, to organize and to uh, you know, be part of the working class and, and get people to be involved in, in a uh, political organization. So just as that movement, the anti-war movement, the anti-racist movement, uh, uh, energized people to get into the labor movement, so also, frankly, the Occupy movement is now energizing the labor movement. There are, just came from a two-day meeting of uh, where the Occupy movement was and how we're going to relate to it, how we're going to build it, how not just build it, but like take it over, build it with our own uh, resources, was the main part of the agenda. In uh, one other thing about the Occupy uh, historic roots, from 1968 to, to, in the same period I was just talking about, 1968 to 1973, the, you know, in 1968 was a huge rebellion really around the world, from France almost taking state power to Mexico City and all kinds of stuff around the country, including, of course, here, in terms of rebellions against racism and lots of big worker struggles from Memphis to Atlanta, etc. And uh, it was in this period of time, too, that people were occupying. I know that uh, I was participating in occupations after they, the National Guard murdered uh, students at Kent State and murdered students at Jackson State. We were taking over buildings. That's an occupation. We were taking over buildings to win certain bands and we're fighting the National Guard. People were taking over buildings to win the right to have African American studies. People were taking over buildings to win the right to have Chicano studies. The American Indian Movement was taking over Pine Ridge Renovation and occupying Alcatraz Island to, to assert Native American rights. They were occupying the BIA in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, the Young Lords Party, the Puerto Rican Young Lords Party, was taking took over a hospital in uh, the South Bronx called the Lincoln uh, Detox Center. With the, they, were, they were trying to demand that the Lincoln Hospital have, keep this detox center. There as now, you know, they were tr fighting against cutbacks, cutting back against a uh, detoxification center. Now the cutbacks are even more broad. So let, let me just uh, end by talking about what are some of the obstacles to the, a natural integration of uh, unions into the Occupy movement and Occupy movement becoming uh, more influential in the labor movement. First, I would say that, that you know, there's some things on a superficial level at least, uh, uh, procedural things that are, are just very uh, new to people who are in the labor movement coming into uh, an, an Occupy meeting. The General Assemblies, all the signs that are used, things like that as procedural matters within the General Assembly. That is uh, a very... Uh, 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 the, uh, uh, so there's that type of obstacle. There's also the obstacle of, of time, there's an obstacle of space. Uh, you know, who, who can come out at, at 1 o'clock in, in the afternoon? Can you really uh, occupy a space for a long period of time when you have kids and you have a job to go to? Uh, it, is the Occupy movement, which is primarily all, uh, uh, primarily white, uh, is it going to, they, oh my God, uh, we got uh, uh, gassed, we got beat, beaten, we got maced. Um, is that movement that, that is justifiably and horrified by, the, by police brutality? going to be in the struggle when, when it's a matter of uh, racist police brutality on a continuing basis. You know, where is the movement going to be? So there's, there are lots of, uh, uh, of, not insurmountable obstacles, but there are lots of uh, uh, bumps along the way, I guess, in terms of the labor movement being able to get into uh, the Occupy movement from that perspective. Now, on the other hand, uh, the obvious thing for, for people who are not in the labor movement uh, and how can you relate? How can the Occupy movement relate to the labor movement? You know, the, the uh, if the image is all, all white guys, number one, 
and, and if they're, they're, uh, they're the way in which they run meetings and, and the need for, for uh, organization and leadership is, is, is done one way here and it's done another way there, because I can tell you that the union movement is very used to, to uh, organization, very used to, to leadership, uh, at, at both from a negative and a positive perspective, that that represents a certain problem in terms of getting, getting people involved. So I just wanted to make those comments to try to highlight some of the reasons for the lack of all in uh, and uh, to, just to open up this um, conversation about the labor movement and the Occupy movement. Yes, sir. One of the things that I see standing in the way of labor coming all in and this is actually something that we've dealt with with AFSCME. I'm from Occupy Springfield and we've been working with the unions in town is that one of the things standing in the way in all, of all ends is labor politics. I mean, we just were pushed by the labor unions to oppose a specific bill. And when it came time to our rally... That's not specific, it was SEIU. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was not asked me, it was SEIU. And, uh, but when we talked to other, you know, when I talked to asked me people about, you know, you had 2,300 people in the... Uh, Rotunda last uh, last month. When are they going to come out for us? And the answer was, we can't oppose that bill because of internal politics. You know, because we're asking for tax breaks for ourselves, mm -hmm. so it's going to be hard for us to oppose tax breaks from other people. Well, well actually, that's a, not uh, uh, Jim probably said it to you. That's not um, fully accurate, or maybe it was not understood <laughs> accurately uh, when he was describing it. That. Uh, uh, first of all, there, there are, as anybody who's been in the labor movement for a long time, there are sometimes practical things that, they, that the union movement, because they have a narrow perspective, they're going to say, okay, well, we got to do this, and therefore we're not going to uh, do something else to rock the boat. And in this particular moment, uh, the question was, where, was the legislature going to pass something to stop the closure of seven facilities, most of which were, mental, uh, were developmental disability centers and mental health centers, and lay off... Uh, um, 2,000 people, and and that's what hung in the balance. And they and the question was, is pushing on this going to piss off somebody uh, regarding that? Uh, that that's a bullshit. And, and B, B, I can tell you though, well, I know that you heard that, that that's not the full reason for not participating. The um, uh, because the, the, I can tell you that the union as a, as a whole is, is absolutely behind the issue of taxing the rich, and, and I think that we should be, from the tactical things, we should be uh, targeting those people who voted to this other way, the Democrats and Republicans, and using that as an organizing vehicle. But it wasn't the whole thing. It's also, part of the problem is uh, when we bring in thousands, and uh, it's a, uh, it's not just putting something on Facebook, it's a, it's a total organizational effort. And it requires a lot of resources, and we, uh, it's, a, it's a gauge of what's possible at a particular moment. I guess, I guess my, my perspective is kind of that, especially Occupy Springfield has been asked to do a lot by the, move, by the unions. We've worked very hard with the unions, SEIU in particular. Um, you know, and I love the union guys who are coming out as individuals and supporting us. But especially, especially in the case of the SB 397, we put together a rally opposing a bill that we were asked to, and the most we get is a couple dozen members. You know, and it's been it's been portrayed to me as you know we don't want to scare people away that we're trying to co-opt. We you know there's been a lot of different views, but I just wonder. I just have I haven't seen the commitment be reciprocated both ways in our local situation where we where especially given our position in the capital, we are very set to work with the unions because, you know, every major union has an office in the capital and, or not every, but, you know, they're there because it's where politics takes place in the state of Illinois. And so I know, especially within our group, there's, there's you know, rumblings of, you know, we're helping you here, we're helping you here, we're helping you here, we're helping you here, you know, we're coming out on the 8th you know, to work on the solidarity stuff, and it's, we're not seeing reciprocation. On the 8th, about the solidarity stuff? It's something about joblessness. AFSCME is the one who's, or at least the way that Jim's, about Jim Dixon, at least the way Jim is portraying it, yeah. is, is that AFSCME is organizing something and that we're getting behind it with them. Okay, well, I'll have to talk to you about it. <laughs> I was just going to say, you know, I'm a member of Occupy St. Louis, and 
Um, I'm underemployed and have been. I was laid off in 2009. And my union was unable to save my job. And I still take what resources I have and I go out there. And I don't know what the real reason is. You know, when, when the unions are ready, they come, they support us, they're there. But when we need them, there's a disparity on why. And maybe it's because, you know, it's been so long since they had to fight scabs and since they had to get out there and really protect what it is. But I don't think that they realize, and I know people are aware enough, or maybe they don't care, that we're in that position again. Because I'll tell you what, you know, I have an education and I have no job. And I'm not going to be the only one who isn't. And so I think that maybe, you know, people need to become more aware and more active. You don't have to have the whole union with you to come down there when you're not at work and bring what you have to offer. Because I make $8.50 an hour. I have a car that needed new brakes four months ago. And I'm there as much as I can possibly be there. And I think that that is, you know, a, a, I don't know. It's a little bit bothersome or somewhat offensive to me. To, for there to be excuses why they're not there when it doesn't benefit them. Well, we shouldn't make excuses because the, you know. the uh, uh, well, but but at the same time, what we need to do is figure out the solutions. The uh, right. and, but also and figure out the solutions with the perspective that we know that as Don was pointing out earlier, we know that the labor leadership uh, can be either very conservative or or inactive. So the question is, or even where it's active, it may have other obligations at the same time. Well, and also maybe the problem is that we don't have leaders, and maybe that's hard to relate to. It's very it hard was to relate for to. me going in there, but you know, it's it's about making real change as to whether or not that is comes to fruition. We need to deal with that and not kind of go, well, it's not quite safe enough. I, I don't I don't know that that's necessarily where we all need to be. I mean, I'm just speaking off the cuff, and I'm not trying to be aggressive or anything. Maybe I sound that way. I just, I, I find it frustrating, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I find it frustrating, you know. I, I think now is the time to stand up and assert ourselves because as all, you know, I'm sorry. You're taking part of my life for $8.50 an hour, okay? I'm, what I have to offer is worth more than that. And that's for every other worker or unemployed worker. We're the ones who keep things in our communities and our cities in this country running. And they need to understand that. And if they don't understand that, then we're all slaves forever. And the bureaucracy of where the unions and everything else will just continue to be what it is. One, one quick point, not so much in terms of how the Occupy movement and the unions can work together, but more of kind of like a perspective thing. One, I think one thing about the Occupy movement is that you know, you've seen that it's mostly youth, right? It's mostly students, but also young workers and things like that. I think it's important because you, you know, when the, it's kind of like a barometer you know, for the weather. That before like the big layers, you'd say, or the main bulk of the working class might go into action as a work, and when they might be coming on the streets and trying to you know, change things, or at least try to you know, defend some of the games, it will be the students first. And it's also interesting, I think, the fact that you've seen all these events going on in, in the Middle East. You know, first you had the revolution in Egypt, and what does that do? That, that inspires people in Wisconsin. And then you see people in Greece struggle, and then it inspires people, when people in France struggle, that inspired you know, the, the Arab events. And that's going to that's gonna be a continuing like loop for the foreseeable future, I think. But in the meantime, that doesn't mean we're going to win. But uh, because then we, we also need like a winning strategy as it were. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing I wanted to say, though, in terms of the unions working with the Occupy movement, I mean, that needs to happen, obviously, but it, it, I think it's also, quick, again, a question of what are the policies or what are the, what are the philosophy of, of the leaders of the movement, right? You know, we have, like, this last April, say, you know, uh, they have this youth convention, right? Yeah, next up. Yeah, yeah, next up. And uh, um, I'm also involved in a campaign for a labor party. We intervened there. You know, we, we raised the idea, why, do we, why can't we break from the Democrats and have our own party? There's a lot of support for that idea. Yeah. But, yeah. But, but the thing is, is you know, the, you know, Trump had responded to that. He said, well, you know, no, I agree with that in general, but now is not the right time. So they delay, right? But as long as they're still tied or holding on to that link, mm -hmm. however tenuous and however much Trump could feel, you know, fire under his butt, as it were, for supporting them, you know, as long as that link's still there, it's gonna, I think it's going to hamper what they're able to do. But 
I think it's what, what the other uh, brother was saying earlier, that it's a matter of rank and file forcing them to do that. So, okay. But I'll do Don, then you, then you. But before, uh, let me just uh, give an anecdote about Trumpka. Uh, there was a meeting in, uh, in Cleveland this summer, in, uh, in July, of all the central labor councils in the Midwest region. And, um, and Trumpka was there, and uh, you know, this, potentially it could have been a, a, an important meeting for uh, strategy. Because uh, all in the wake of Wisconsin, everybody wanted to push forward. It had what was happening in Ohio. It was in Ohio because of uh, the events in Ohio. And, uh, and I proposed to Trumpka in the, in the floor, uh, from the floor of the meeting, that, uh, that, that this was in July, and I said in, in September is the an anniversary, like the 30th anniversary of, of uh, Solidarity Day 1. Why don't we have a huge demonstration right here, to bring a national demonstration to bring all of labor here. Everybody's energized about Wisconsin. Everybody's energized about what's happening in Ohio. Nobody wants to be in their own little town getting uh, killed on this stuff. Let's have a, a big national demonstration. And he said, oh, we couldn't possibly do that in, in that period of time, uh, even though it was done in much less time in 1981. But by the end of that, by the end of that meeting, the, uh, the FLCO leadership sort of lost control of, of that, uh, that meeting, and there were lots of other people who have wanted to do more, but done. But. Yeah, I was just going to kind of analyze my trying to get people involved with our, with organized labor involved with Occupy Movement. And, you know, I'll, I'll just say this as a, again, as a labor union leader for 40 years, good luck. Uh, but, I mean, uh, I, I just, you know, trying to get them to come to union meetings, you know, and I spent 27 years trying to hand, you know, the basic leadership of our local union over to the rank and file, and they didn't want anything to do with it. You're doing just fine. I pay my dues. You take care of it. Uh, you know, I would create issues just so I could get enough people to come to a union meeting, okay, that would directly impact them. I think the focus needs to be on the underemployed and the laid off union workers and going directly to them who have the time to come out and be involved and get them educated as to the broader issues so that they can then argue with their union leadership and their involvement. Also, I think you need to focus and look at trying to go out and organize the unorganized worker and bring them in involved with the movement, the people that aren't part of the union movement, okay? Uh, the unorganized uh, workforce out there, which is much greater than the unionized workforce, uh, and bring them involved in it. Uh, that, you know, that's, that might be a little bit devious thinking, but, you know, That'll bring labor to our Wall Street or the Occupy Wall Street movement because they'll see the opportunity then to try and organize workers. Okay, uh, and so you know consolidate those groups, but it is very difficult. Uh, and with respect to the issue that you think it's a one-way street, there's no question. You know, I have found that time and time again when you know my membership would say, where are all the people to support us on our issue? Where's Jobs with Justice and all of that? And I'd say, they'll be there. But will you be there when they need something? And most of the time, they weren't. You know, and it just used to really upset me. And I'd say, well, what do you want me to do in the future? These people aren't going to come to our aid every day in time. We need something if we're not going to come to their aid. There is that disconnect. Uh, and I'm not sure what you know, how you overcome that. One of the problems I've always had is that people get to a point where they're very comfortable, they make big bucks, and they think that all of a sudden, you know, they're part of the capitalist society. Well, they don't realize that as long as they're not signing the front of that check and they're signing the back of that check, it can be taken away from them in a heartbeat. You know, and that's what we've got to educate the trade unionists about. That, you know, it's only there uh, for so long. It can be taken away quickly. Okay, I just, from the hallway, I just got to uh, wrap it up. So let's, uh, three, three more speakers. But. Um, I was actually going to say something very similar. I think that unions need to do a much better job in getting their underemployed and unemployed workers down to occupations. Mm -hmm. I feel like sitting at home is not as productive as sitting in a tent. And while that might seem counterintuitive, um, it just 
the education that goes on at Occupy is something that will create the next generation of union leaders. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need the youth who are currently unemployed because they haven't been in the union long enough, and right now it's their time to sit out a job or two, right. to actually get you know, some organizing experience and be able to take that on to grow in the union ranks and be able to take their experience and move forward. Two or maybe three or four points. Point one is there's a lot of suspicion, and, and you actually said it in your address about uh, the unions getting together to take over. You know, and that's a concern that people have. I think it's a misplaced concern because I don't think there's really anything to take over. But. You know,